Hi all, let's have a look now at a Fire on Board Shirov game. He's, he's the author of a chess book called Fire on Board. And it's because many of his games have amazing um, complications. You don't really know what's going on at all. And uh, yeah, I've, I've read a lot of his annotations. They're really, really amazing. The depth, uh, the tactical genius of Alexei Shirov. He's a FIDE rated 2706. In this match against Guatemala, actually they had an FM playing on board one, not the strongest team in the Olympiad. Uh, the FM, uh, Santino Kinanas, so Guatemala's board one. Uh, okay, let's have a look at that game. So Shirov playing white, E4, and we see E5, Knight F3, and Petrov defense, which... Um, can be a good equalizing method for black sometimes uh, but this is pushing it against the 26 <laughs> 2706 G, uh, super gm um, the rating difference i don't know if you can play solidly for a draw against such players they're going to find ways to get an advantage so how does alexei shirov get the get the advantage out of the opening if possible knight takes e5 d6 okay he doesn't go crazy with knight f7 here, which is some weird gambit, apparently. He plays uh, knight f3. Okay, so knight takes e4, d4. And now black plays bishop e7. I think often d5 is the move. This is an alternative to what's going on here. Bishop d3, and black is not... Uh, leaving the knight here in this variation it's just moving it back so is black's position solid here after castles black's got this pin now bishop g4 which would seem to be annoying how to unpin that knight is white really going to spend the move putting the bishop back well okay there is a way of cleverly kind of putting pressure on this bishop to sort of encourage it to go away from the pin this knight bd2 move has an implication as we'll see in the game continuation that knight c4 will then be useful for knight e3 which will attack that bishop okay so after castles and that's facilitated of course because black hasn't played d5 so it isn't uh, stopping white from using c4 square here so white uses that c4 square knight c4 and of course if d5 then also tempting is knight e5 so black wants to keep control of e5 here one would expect knight bd7 knight e3 so the bishop just goes to h5 though so still maintaining that pin knight f5 and this is looking like an uncomfortable knight and black plays rook e8 as though he might be interested in preserving the dark square bishop white's not interested in taking that dark square bishop here though instead white is creating an attacking position building up an attacking position on the king's side with this next move h3 so he's really going to unpin with g4 actually and then f5 will be supported even more so bishop f5 g4 bishop goes back and now an unusual looking move knight 3 to h4 the knights protect each other f5 really supported here by white c6 and now actually knight takes g6 okay that bishop wasn't doing anything you might argue there so why take it off well there's a point to it knight g3 white has a plan of putting more pressure on the king side here and not making use of the e file with epoxy exchange of rooks no this rook is going to do work on the f file and help cause havoc around black's king position later d5 and now g5 fixing the g6 pawn so that's ready to be undermined now with this f4 f5 operation knight e4 but first some little details need to be handled this pawn is being attacked queen g4 now white is ready to start attacking soon with f4 f5 bishop d6 okay again g3 is a little bit annoying now white doesn't perhaps want black to have this option of taking on g3 uh, 
he actually takes on e4, giving up what you might think is a really useful attacking piece. Okay, so why has he done that? Well, black can't take this one. Knight takes e4. So he's not actually giving up the light square bishop. If black uh, plays bishop takes g3, then white has the option now to preserve the light square bishop. Okay, and white preserves it with bishop d3. Okay, so we've still got this beautiful light square bishop with f4, f5 now on the cards. Bishop goes back, f4, starting the undermining. And it's going to weaken black's king further, in theory, if it doesn't weaken white's king with all these... Uh, squares being a bit loosened. So knight f8, f5 and immediate pressure now here. White with the bishop pair. It looks like a very fine attacking position. G takes, queen takes, immediate threat, queen f7 check. The knight is protecting h7 at the moment. So queen protects f7. Bishop d2. So if given time maybe something like rook f2 Rook f1 after, or maybe rook f3, um, rook f1. Okay, we'll see. So g6 is played, which weakens some dark squares, of course. Queen g4. Black has to do something to generate some counterplay here. He plays c5, which seems logical enough. And funny enough, white doesn't react with c3. Uh, there might be some technical reasons for this, uh, that c3 might not be that playable in this particular position. Let's just engine check here, because this looks like a bit of a strange move. But actually, engines like it. Shiro's choice is d takes c5 here. So why not just try and support the pawn with c3? What would happen here? Is it so bad? Queen b Six. Let's say rook f2, knight e6. This d pawn is a bit of a liability in this variation. So maybe that's the point. White doesn't want to maintain that liability. And he, if he has to protect it with that, then that's not so attacking for, for white. And black can start to use the e file maybe. So something like this. And it looks as though this could be comfortable for black. So the way um, Shirov was playing it now with d takes c5, okay, he's also opening up, of course, this diagonal for potentially this bishop. Bishop takes c5, check, king g2. Bishop e3, though, might avoid the exchange of the dark square bishops. Queen e5, which, okay, is attacking b2, but there's white needs to protect b2 here. Shirov just plays h4. Why worry about the queenside pawns when, when white's going for the king? Queen takes b2, bishop g3. And there's also rook b1 on the cards here. And this might be the key, um, a key blunder in this position. Um, because bishop g3 does mean rook b1's possible. Before, of course, it wasn't. The rooks weren't connected. And from an engine point of view, I think the move is queen d4 here. And black should be, in theory, from an engine point of view, okay. Or even, I'm not going to say a slightly bit better. White, white's better um, on this very brief analysis here. White's still better after this pawn sack. It's a dangerous position, but maybe not as dangerous as the game continuation. This variation sort of shows it is still quite dangerous and scary. But... Um, Maybe black can hold on here um, with a bit of luck in these variations. Maybe a resource like Queen H8 the computer finds here is going to be useful. But that's that's veering off. In the game, this Rook AC8, you see the evaluation go, go quite significantly up for white. Because an access route has been created, a clear one, to the king, to F7 with tempo. That's very, very dangerous, Rook AB1 now. And queen d4, black, black could play queen d4 here, but then again, white can now take on d4 here and just take on b7. 
and this this is dangerous. What does what does Black do about f7 here? He can't easily defend f7. If he has to give up f7 here, clear advantage for White. So things start to go really downhill now. Black actually plays Queen takes a2, and as we know from many recent master game examples on the channel, once the Queen's away from the King, mind you, it's got potential to protect f7. You would think. Uh, but apart from that, its influence is much less over here for king safety of the black king. And uh, we've got resources converging now. Rook takes b7. So black tries to offer a discouragement, maybe, and also supporting the bishop, freeing the rook, maybe, to, to be used. So that's protecting f7, you'd think. But no, white doesn't mind. White plays rook f, f7. So we have to look at what about this queen takes f7 here? Wouldn't that help black? Here's a variation prepared from earlier. Say this happened, which it didn't. Apparently there's a check here. This is very dangerous. Queen b7 check. And here, technically, if king h8, there's an overloading on these rooks. If king h8, there's bishop e5 check here. And you can't take here because of queen takes. And otherwise you get mated. So basically, king h8 is out of the question in this variation check forcing that because otherwise bishop e5 is is very strong again or queen f7 and bishop e, e5 is probably going to be strong or queen f7 and bishop g6 so, so let's let's go with rook e6 and here again overloading is is apparent bishop takes g6 and this is just too dangerous for black the, the rooks are not coordinating that well white well, has the bishop pair and also these two dangerous pawns which are dangerous attacking resources here. So this this would be fairly dire for black, this kind of position. So if we go back, maybe this is why black decided to, to play this instead. Rook takes c2 check. Just trying to go for the, the white king. The exchange stack doesn't have to be taken, of course. White sidesteps with king h3. It will be giving black um, unnecessary chances or may even be losing to accept this exchange sack. Let's just check it out. No, it's not losing. It could have been taken. <laughs> okay. Well but King H3 is actually a much stronger move now on this on this depth. What was played was actually much stronger. Bishop takes C two check. And if we go King H3 here then there's Queen C six pointing at H one. Um so unnecessary to give black counterplay here. King h3 sidestepping. Okay. So back to the game. Rook c1 trying to drum up something. And now queen f3 extinguishes rook h1 as a threat and also attacks, of course, in some variations now. And we see um, now the dangerous looking move which black may have been banking on here maybe finding this incredible why would uh, Shirov allow this uh, check okay looks a bit dangerous but actually white does have uh, actually more than one good alternative Shirov plays a spectacular looking move though which might not be necessary just king g2 might actually be good as well believe it or not here but the spectacular looking move he played I wonder if you can guess it if I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Very elegant. Okay. White played bishop f5. And this might not be immediately obvious why, but it, it's sort of um, winning. If, if g takes f, it's a false mate with, with check here. And white has access to the h5 square because of that that wrenching out of the g-pawn so queen h5 is mating so that's why bishop f5 is a bit of a crusher okay queen c6 is played from black and white simply here uh, realizes that um, even though he's a pawn down okay um, his rooks are, are huge on the seventh rank so he can just take queens here and now the killer move here which I think is 
an absolutely su superb rerouting move. I don't know if it'll be how obvious it'll be to to to, to you guys on on YouTube, boys and girls on YouTube. But this this rerouting here is uh, celebrating another access route to the king. Uh, this one, I wonder if you can guess it. That's the clue. What does Shiro play in this position? If I give you ten seconds, starting from now. Okay, Bishop B1. This has got time for Bishop B1, and believe it or not, Bishop B1 secures White advantage here. Um, it's the strongest move in the position. I think Bishop B1, huge, huge advantage for White after Bishop B1. Stronger than other alternatives. Well, Rook G7 as well is strong for Bishop D7. That's interesting as well. But Bishop E1, no, it's emerging now as a winner on deck 15. Bishop B1 creates huge threats against the Black King. So Black tries Rook B6. But now we get the Bishop A2, the rerouting. Very, very powerful rerouting. What can Black do here? The f the fret now, well, there's there's lots of frets. Um, Black took off this rook, and after check, knight e6. We have a very neat, simple, tactical finish to so essentially win a piece. Can you spot it? If I give you ten seconds here. Okay, just simply rook b8. What can black do here? If he tries to defend like this, then rook takes and the knight drops off, and that's that's winning. Uh, if he takes the rook, then we we do, we just uh, play bishop takes e6, and then bishop takes b8. So that was pretty neat. It was um, you know so, something was gained from the opening. This this f file leverage. And we saw all sorts of access routes to the Black King being celebrated there. Uh, let's have a look at that again. So from the Petrov, uh, this variation of the Petrov, interesting, Bishop E7, instead of D5. And Black gets this seemingly nasty pin, which White kicks that Bishop soon all the way back to G6, reinforces the F5 Knight, undoubles Sorry, doubles the pawns, and he's about to fix these pawns as a prelude to, to wrenching open the F file. Um, he's maintaining his light square bishop unless Black wants to lose a pawn, which isn't a good idea here. So he's just getting rid of that e4, that knight, and now f4, f5 is ripe to play, and it's a beautiful attacking position. He doesn't want any anything to have to protect in the center. So when black plays c5, maybe instructive is this capture away from the center. Okay, and avoiding the dark square bishops coming off. Having the bishop pair is a nice attacking player's friend, the bishop pair here. Forget about the queenside pawns. It's another access route basically as it turned out. Black should have tried maybe queen d4 here. So we have this the rooks joining forces on the seventh rank, and it's ineffectual to use the queen to take both rooks off here, as the variations shown. Black tries for a counter attack, and now queen f3 extinguishes rook h1, and queen e6 is extinguished with bishop f5. Nasty move, bishop f5, because it's just undermining that h5 square in these variations. Everything will be running with check to make the black king here. And now a pawn down, but uh, with the rooks installed on the seventh rank, just need more force to bear on the black king. And the kind of weakness of the last move, of course, is uh, taking here as well. But no, the bishop is protected by the, by the rook as well. Um, mind you, that would have been impossible because of rook takes maybe, with the, the king being able to take on f7. So that that is important as well. That the rook's not controlling at all uh, b1. 
because otherwise rook takes b1 and king takes f7. If here, then king h8. So in this position, bishop b1 is fully playable to get onto that very, very dangerous diagonal here. It's nifty stuff. Bishop b1. And you might think, okay, really? Is this really uh, winning for black? The cynical among you, let's just, just check this. Could black do any better? Remember, you've got two rooks on the seventh rank here. Let's try defence knight e6. Apparently rook f6 is strong here, because the knight that does come off g6 there. Let's go with this. This looks a bit desperate, this idea. Check. Rook h6. It looks as though white's resources are converging menacingly on the black king here. So knight e6 is probably not a brilliant defensive try. Rook a6 is interesting instead of the game continuation, which appears to be some sort of blunder, rook b6, a, a major blunder from an engine point of view. But, um, oh no, it's now the second best move. If rook a6, you might be wondering, what would be crushing here? Again, the bishop can try and get onto this diagonal with bishop d3. Echo variations attacking the rook. And if rook c6 here, bishop b5, forcing to get on this diagonal because it's skewing the rooks now anyway. You could just win the exchange here. And this should be okay. Okay, that's that's okay for white. So bishop b1 breaking down black's defences after the queens have just been exchanged off. So no respite for, for black. Okay, so rook b8, the final move here. And you might think, okay, hold on a sec, uh, that I didn't mention the obvious king h8. Yes, and that would be a good point. So what is the winning move here? I think this could be a special little move, actually, as well. Um... To save embarrassment, what is the move here? Bishop f7 is 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 dangerous for black. Rook e4, and now rook b8. Bishop d6. Crunch. Ouch. So there's a lot of pressure here after bishop f7. Um, I think one of the points, the rook is kind of tied down to trying to defend e5 against bishop e5 check. So say say the rook comes off this diagonal, bishop e5 check, and this is going to be crunch time. It's going to be a forced mate there. So if the rook's tied down to that, to that file, so we have this continuation we're now rook b8, bishop d5, and the rook's not given too many choices here. So it goes back to e7, and then it goes into straight into that skewer. And that's much better for, for white. Okay, so that did, did need some explanation actually, why this position is crushing. It looks as though almost... Um, It looks as though almost there's a bishop e5 disaster, but black's controlling e5. So rook f7, I mean bishop f7 is the incisive move here to try and uh, disrupt the rook from the e5 square. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that game. Uh, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much. Oh, and by the way, the result of that ma match, it was 3-1 to Latvia, Latvia versus, sorry, pardon me, this match was against Guatemala, and it was actually three and a half half. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.